My name is Dr. Frank J. Carfus. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm married into the Tsinjina family with my wife, obviously, who was from Youngstown, whose mother was a Chalikas, Irene Chalikas, which was a very famous, popular family as far as this whole operation was concerned. Her, my wife's grandfather, was one of the individuals that started this whole Tsinjina arrangement from the fact that they, when these gentlemen immigrated to the United States, they tried to figure out how are we going to keep in touch with each other. And they, besides keeping correspondence and so on and so forth. Now this is the 18, I mean the 1910, maybe 1920 age, but many of them came through Ellis Island, of course. And ironically enough, my wife's grandfather was named James Chalikas. And in the Greek tradition, as you may already know, the paternal grandfather, his name, in the, the name is used on the firstborn son. So that went through the whole chain of the command, and my son happens to be James. So when we married and we came after we had finished and I finished my training and then we went to Japan for three years and then we came back here in 65. We were married in 59. We came back here in 65. And ever since then, every the end of July, uh, we've always been good uh, participators in the Tsinjina organization which goes along with my mother-in-law, who was a Chalikas, and there are six Chalikas sisters and two Chalikas brothers. And they've all been very active with the Tsinzina Society. So we just, we live in Cleveland, and uh, our two children both uh, work in Cleveland, Jim and Irene. <clears throat> And uh, it's just been a marvelous association as far as being able to keep in contact. And uh, my father came from Greece, and he was from the Karpinician area, which is the central part of Greece. My mother was born here in the States, but my grandparents were from Sparta. So uh, ironically enough, my father-in-law was from Sparta, let alone my in-law, my mother-in-law being a, uh, a Chalikas, was from the Tsinzina Zupina area. So uh, I've been coming here ever since. My son is on the board, uh, and we've always supported the organization because it's a marvelous group. What's so nice about it is the fact that the young people take great pride in coming here. And we've got something like 200 people here now, but probably three, four, I mean, a fourth of them is probably young people. So, so tell me about um, some of your memories of coming here from, let's say, well, it's, inter <laughs> it's interesting how some people have met each other, and I just saw a young lady here a little bit ago, and I, I think I embarrassed her a little bit because, my goodness, how you've grown up, and here she's got two children. And I thought to myself, I got a hold of Maria later, and I said, I hope I didn't embarrass you, I said, but I remember you from 20, 25 years ago, I said, and now she says, oh, no, no, she says, it's nice to be remembered that young. And the, the association of people, of course, there's other people that are involved with this. There was a Poulos family from Greenville. Their daughter lives in um, Michigan, and she's married to a, to a judge. Uh, my brother-in-law, who is a Parthamus, now that was my wife's maiden name, Parthamus, P-A-R-T-H-E-M-O-S, so from Youngstown. <clears throat> and my brother-in-law lives in uh, Larchmont, New York. And... Um, Unfortunately, my wife passed away 16 years ago today, and uh, but we've still maintained the tradition. Tell us a little bit about uh, your wife's family and what what brought them to the United States or what they did professionally here. 
Well, when they first started and they came here, it was just the idea of emigrating to the United States in order to find a, a better life. I have no idea what their life existed of when they were in Greece, but nonetheless, this was a better life for them. So when the, grand, when the great grandparents emigrated through Ellis Island, uh, they kind of got dispersed and they uh, ended up in Youngstown, ultimately. I don't know where they may have gone one way or the other. But they, uh, they ultimately ended up in Youngstown and my, um, my wife's grandfather had the Brass Rail restaurant in Youngstown. My father-in-law had the Central Square Grill, which was right on the square in Youngstown. And uh, they just, you know, my father-in-law started out as a dishwasher and eventually bought the restaurant. And he just always had a very hard worker. That's what, they, that's what they all did. Now, you probably maybe not be aware of it, but there are a lot of other of people from this particular organization that started out in Chicago to Detroit to Buffalo to New York to Pittsburgh to Youngstown. And they all got in the um, food product, product business. And not until the railroads came along did they start to transport things from back and forth across the country. And they became very prosperous because they kept in contact with each other and they were just doing what they thought was the right thing to do. You know, what's interesting to me is that many of the people who either worked in restaurants or the families had a restaurants, they put them in touch with the, the broader community. Mm -hmm. So they got a, a chance to really immerse themselves into people felt comfortable coming to the restaurants. So there was a certain rapport. It was a family type of situation and they had great respect because, of course, the proprietors always put the you know, their best foot forward in order to have the, uh, uh, accommodate the customers. And that's exactly what the, the way it lasted. I mean, it's, uh, my father-in-law's restaurant in Youngstown, they'd open up at 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning to get the mill trade. Now this is wartime, 50s, 60s, to get the mill trade going to the steel mills for seven o'clock and they'd have breakfast there and so on and so forth and then of course three thirty, four o'clock in the afternoon these guys were coming off work and coming by to do the same thing and then 10 11 o'clock at night the night crew would come in and they'd stop and have something to eat something to drink and then they'd go on to work and this is which the perpetual he was open seven days a week which is always very interesting. These guys all work seven days a week. My dad worked from seven in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. When he came here to this country, he went to Pittsburgh first, and then he had a cousin there, and he didn't like the idea of working in a steel mill. So one day, dad decides he's gonna take the train and go north to see what the lake looks like, Lake Erie. Well, Grove City, Pennsylvania is halfway between Pittsburgh and Erie. So Dad, they had this, he got off the train in Grove City because the train had to take on water because they were all steam engines. And then the train progressed up to Erie. And Dad was very impressed by this little town called Grove City. So when he gets a small college town, 7,000 people, and he said, when he got back to Pittsburgh, he told his cousins, I'm, I'm going to go to Grove City. And they said, where? They couldn't believe what he's talking about. What are you going to do in Grove City? He said, well, I don't know, but I'll do something there, and so on and so forth. So he goes to Grove City, <coughs> and he orders a shoe shine stand for his shoe shine and hat cleaning stand. That's what he learned how to do. And the man that were at the railroad, at the uh, railway station, got a hold of me one day and asked, we had the biggest laugh with your dad. Who is this dumb Greek coming to Grove City and think he's going to make a living shining shoes and cleaning hats? That was in 1925, 1926. Mother and dad were married in 1928. And they went to Greece for six months for their honeymoon. And then, of course, you know what happened in 1929. So he came back, and my uncle had been running the store and they were watching the building. 
And at that time, I must admit, and I get really miffed about some of these immigrants, at that time, you could not buy property in the United States unless you were a citizen. So he went to Grove City College, night school. A professor Carpenter took him under his wing, and Dad learned how to read and write English and knew what to do. So when it came time for him to apply for his citizenship, he had it, he had it all set to go. And it's just one of those things. He stayed in Grove City and worked hard, and my sister and I were born, and it just goes on and on and on. Well, what led you to your career? In, uh... Well, my career, my dad had a, <coughs> had a building with offices and apartments in it in Grove City, downtown Grove City, big deal, downtown Grove City, Broad Street. So there was a dentist that rented his office from my dad. And I used to go up the back stairway, and Dr. Badger had his office door open, and I'd pop in, you know, and every once in a while he'd say, sit up here on the chair, he said, I want you to do a little waxing up for me. So I did some paper with some waxing up, although I always built airplanes and things like that. I was very active in scouting. I had my eagle, and I ordered the arrow and everything like this. <laughs> so this Dr. Badger came to my mother and dad and said, you know what? Frank can use his hands. He's got good eye to finger cooperation, con uh, uh, con uh, concentration, he said. So he can use his. So, you know, we might just think on pushing him to become a dentist. Well, I went through high school and I always thought maybe I should be a dentist. So I went to high school, graduated from high school, and I applied to Pitt because Grove City is only 60 miles from Pitt. So I applied to Pitt, and I had a couple of nice sponsors, my family dentist, and so on and so forth. And I was accepted in dental school after my second year of college, which is not quite very ordinary, and this is 1954. I, I graduated from high school, 52, went two years to, uh, to Pitt College, got into dental school in 54, graduated in 58, but while I was going to school at Pitt, I knew maybe I ought to get my bachelor's degree, which I could not get because you only had 66 credits, and you need 96 for a bachelor's degree. So I went to night school and summer school for the four years plus while I was in dental school to get my additional credits for my bachelor's degree. Finally, in 1961, I got my bachelor's degree. I finished my oral surgery training after three years. I went to Cornell Medical Center in New York and St. Vincent Charity Hospital in, Pitt, in Cleveland and the Graduate School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. I finished my training, and we had gotten married in 59, and I thought, well, you know, we were eligible for the draft until we were 44. Now this is 1961. I thought to myself, why should I get into practice and all of a sudden get snapped out of the air? Because I was only, let me see, I was 61. In 1961, I was uh, 30, 40, 40, 50. I was like 27, 28 years old. And I said, I got, I, got 20, I got 15 years to go before they snatch me for the draft. So my wife and I decided we'll go to Washington and enlist. Went to the Army, and the Army didn't want me because they were treating their own oral surgeons in Texas. The Navy didn't want me because they only used a certain oral surgeons, and many of them are on aircraft carriers. The Air Force said, where do you want to go? I thought, that's pretty strange. So they opened up the huge manifest book, and they said, well, you can either go to South Ricelip, England, or you can go to Tachikawa, Japan. Well, I looked at Stella Ann, and I said, that's no discussion. So we decided we'd go to Japan. That was in 1961, October. Our daughter <coughs> was 15 months old. And I signed on for three years because if you only signed on for two, you couldn't take your family with you. So we went, I signed on for three years. We went to Japan. I was the only oral surgeon there for two and a half years in the whole Kanto Base Command, which is the immediate Tokyo area. 
and there were 38 general dentists and prosthodontists and periodontists in the whole area. So I was at the hospital. We had a 350 bed hospital. We went from the elderly to the newborn. They covered everything. So I told, I got the word out to a lot of the uh, young first lieutenants because I went in as a captain with my training years behind me. And of course, I told these young lieutenants, I said, you guys find any pathology or something's going on. I said, you get the patient to me and I'll have you come and scrub with me in surgery. Well, they just fallen all over themselves. They thought this was a pretty good idea. So we spent three years in Japan. We went to the Greek, to the Russian Orthodox Church in downtown Tokyo, which was called Nikolaido. Now, the outstanding factor about Nikolaido is the Russian Orthodox Church built this cathedral in downtown Tokyo in 1865. They made an inroad into the Japanese culture as far as the Shintos and all the other uh, religions. And that building, of course, is still standing. So we had a very interesting tour there because then we went to the Orthodox Cathedral in downtown Tokyo. So while we're there, all of a sudden, here comes a bishop in from the United States, Bishop Vladimir. Well, he came in because they, the Orthodox Church brought him in from the States because they wanted him to generate the capacity of a Japanese bishop in Japan, not a foreign bishop, which was good protocol. All of a sudden, I find out, seeing Father uh, Bishop Vladimir, he was originally from Cleveland, and he was at St. Theodosian Church in Cleveland, and he went to the monastery and trained in the monastery, and when he found out that Stella Ann and I were from Cleveland, we just, we, we had a marvelous time. <laughs> we both were on the board, besides our Kumbadi, who are now our Kumbadi that we knew there, and uh, for, for, for two and a half years, it was just a wonderful experience. We learned a lot about the church. And at that time, the other counterpart Orthodox church in Japan tried to get rid of the bishop because they didn't like, he was a threat to their religions. But we were able to quell that whole situation. So we came back here in 65. And I started to practice in downtown Cleveland. And uh, I teach at the dental school at Case Western Reserve University. I'm on the staff at three hospitals. I'm chief of the oral surgery department at, at uh, St. Vincent Charity. Uh, I have clinics in the two different hospitals. And uh, I just keep very busy and I've been very active in the medical staff affairs. I've been president of the medical staff at St. Vincent's three different times which is, is most unusual because dentists just aren't elected to the presidency of the medical staff. And this is all primarily confined to physicians. But a couple of the guys thought that I had the potential, and so that was, that was how that ended. That was in the 1990s, and I'm still practicing actively, and uh, that's about all I can tell you. Have you seen an emergence in your generation of other Greek, uh, in Greeks in the medical profession, and even in Cleveland? I mean, what's your and, and do, they, do they talk to each other? Oh yeah. When I was in dental school, now you find you might find this hard to believe. When I was in dental school in 1954, when I was accepted, I was one of two individuals of Greek extraction. There were two blacks that were accepted. There were three Jews that were accepted. When we got to know this about each other, we said, boy, oh boy, you, you talk about a quota system. We're, we're living it. Well, fortunately, now things are pretty much changed, and there are a lot of physicians and dentists who are of Greek extraction, and um, that's what, that, but that was the transition at that time. Yeah. Do you think that um, 
there's something in the Greek nature that that um, that led you toward the, the healing profession. I mean, was, was it? Oh, I, I, I uh, the, the the biggest thing was my parental support. My dad always said, you know, you, you, okay, fine, you're going to go to college, you're going to want to go to dental school, fine. So when I got into dental school after two years, uh, he thought that was pretty good. So when I graduated in 58, I said, uh, I think I want to go into oral surgery because I like oral surgery. And one of the premier fathers of oral surgery was my professor at Pitt, Dr. Harry Archer. And dad said to me, You've gone for dentistry. If you don't make it in oral surgery, remember, you wanted to get dentistry first. Kind of making sure I wasn't going to get disappointed. So that was the end of that story. So when I, got my, when I finished my training and graduated from University of Pennsylvania that uh, uh, June 1961, that was, I, I completed what I wanted to do, and he was, obviously, my parents are very proud. Yeah. I'll tell you, you've probably been to Greece. Yes. What do you think about their, their current state in terms of uh, Terrible. Medical, medical professionals? Oh, professionals, that's different. But the, I thought you were going to talk about, no, the, the oh, professionals is fine. Well, Skevel Zervis is an example of that. Dr. Zervis? <laughs> He graduated from medical school in Greece, and he's been in this country. His father was a physician in Youngstown. And there's a lot of Greek practitioners in the city, in the area, in the whole country. I mean, they just, it's just one of those things. We don't, we don't publicize it, but it's just there, you know? You're always there. So really, those humble beginnings of coming from the restaurant business, well I think I have my son might be able to tell you better but I think I have I've I've accomplished a lot. I came into Cleveland only because I had my residency at St. Vincent, and my chief, when I came back from Japan, said, you know, I'm not going to be practicing much longer. He said, why don't you come into the office? Because he knew how I was trained. And, of course, everybody at St. Vincent Hospital knew me, and it was a slam dunk through credentials for me to be accepted. And uh, I just kept kept on working hard, and he gave me all the hospital cases, which I covered for uh, the emergency room. But we have a little problem as far as some of these younger people. I mean, they've got huge loans from school. I'm not talking about dentists. I'm talking about physicians and dentists and other people. These huge loans that they have that they have to pay off, and they want to get with the profession. <laughs> and many of them will go with Sears or... Uh, Aspen or something like this, and then they go on to develop their own practice. But I didn't have that problem. When I was accepted, got into private practice, I just I just hit it running, and that's all there was to it. Well, it's interesting because it makes you think that what, what the net result of that is the stifle people from choosing these professions. <coughs> yeah. And, um, and I, I wonder... Has, have, has there been a discussion within the professional community about how do we help support uh, young physicians coming into the field, either through their own endowments or other things like that? Well, well that, that's, that's true. I trained juniors and seniors in dental school in oral surgery. I also have a residency program through one of my hospitals that trains interns, residents, and uh, for in oral surgery. And I'm always encouraging them. You know, don't 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 think you know everything is over with. You got to just keep on nurturing the fact that you're doing what you're doing. Do the best you can. Keep your nose clean. Don't get involved in narcotics or anything like this because it's a Two of the most predominant things that people will try to hit on you for is back pain 
and toothaches. And this is where the narcotics come into the situation. And I've learned that a long time ago. And I always caution my residents, don't get taken in by this continual complaint about how this patient is hurting. You've got to cut it off someplace. With the, with the advancements in technology, uh, are some of the, the skills that you learned uh, in, your, in your practice, are they not being passed on uh, because of the convenience of all the tools? I mean, is there something you can approach that you have as a doctor that maybe the younger generation is not learning? The same? What I do, I teach my interns and residents, look what I do see how I stand, use the right instruments, don't get carried away with the fact that you're gonna to try to do it quickly. That's not the answer. Know what you're getting into, because I do maxillofacial reconstruction. Mandibles, upper jaw, I don't do eyes because that's an ophthalmologist situation. But I always caution them about, don't bite off more than, if you feel qualified in what you're gonna do, that's fine. But don't bite off more than you're going to chew. And, of course, we're training them very well. So many of my guys and gals uh, do very nicely. I can't, I can't complain. The one thing that's come a long way is the implant situation. And that's probably in the last 20 years, 22 years. And that's okay. But it's not for everybody. So you just have to take case by case. You mentioned women involved in the profession. How has that changed? It's like, well, like, right now, 50-50 acceptance to dental school is men and women. When I applied to dental school, there was no woman in my class in 56. Not until, it was interesting, our class went in as freshmen. There were a couple women in the class ahead of us. When we passed through the transition of classes, a couple women came into the classes behind us. So we were the only class out of seven years that only had, that didn't have any women. And we caught hell sometimes because the professors didn't take any, take any back seat. And in my class <coughs> was the son of the father of our, ortho, ortho, of our operative department. <coughs> And Dr. Brand would come in and he'd say, God darn it, you guys are just screwing up. And so you had to kind of pull up your, boat, your, your belt and your shoestrings and make sure you weren't going to screw up because the main thing they push for is the education in order to pass the boards. And we all passed our boards that year. So they did a good job. Um, you, you mentioned a word here that you and I probably know, but for those who may not understand what the word kumbaru means. Kumbaru? <laughs> well, the kumbaru is a, 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 an outside the family person who you've taken into your family. And my best example of that is the couple that we met when we were in Japan, John and Tiko, Tina Kozakis. John was in the Army Map Service. He was stationed there for seven years. And we got to know them through church. So lo and behold, when we're coming back, John and Tina said, we want to baptize your next child. And that's Jim. We stuck together. Jim was born in 65. They came to Cleveland, Chris and Jim. And we have been very close kumbadi ever since that time. It's the outside influence that assists in teaching your child something about the religion and the way the, the society operates as opposed to just coming from your parents. It's, uh, you know, when there's a lot of kumbadi around here, I can tell you that. 